many doubted we'd ever see it, but here it is. The return to glory. McDavid stops up. What a move. Shoots. Scores! Oh, my goodness, I can't believe it's been so long. Robin Brownlee joins us, as always, on The Outsiders. How are you doing today? Hey, pal, I'm fine. What are we at now? Uh, episode 21 coming up, and it feels somehow like it's been like seven months since we did the last one. <laughs> well, not only has it been <laughs> seven months, we're now doing it differently. You and I aren't even in the same room anymore, which I, I guess is kind of fun. And kind of nice for both of us. We don't have to uh, actually uh, be sitting across from each other. But so much has changed in seven months. I don't even know where to start, but the last time we dropped a podcast was the 6th of January. And here we are. It's uh, the last full week of August. So we're back. Where do you want to start? Well, I I think it would probably be fair to say uh, some things have changed. And uh, as I... Uh, said earlier when we were chatting, I hope uh, I hope these are both once in a lifetime things, Bryn. Yeah. Um, we are in the middle of a pandemic known as COVID nineteen right now, but I think before COVID came along, um, you went away after a trip to the Czech Republic, and that's your story, and it's uh, it's a compelling one, and uh, it's one I think you should tell before we take uh, another step forward uh, as to why it's been seven months since anybody heard from us. Well, I feel like I've told this story to a million people, but we do have to address it again because, you know, those who would follow us on a sports perspective like this probably don't know what would happen to me. And, uh, yeah, I returned from the World Junior Hockey Championship in the Czech Republic the very first week in January and we were getting all set to restart up. We'd put some holiday shows together. And just before, in fact, I think it was the day before we were about ready to get started, I, uh, I collapsed at home with a bleeding ulcer. So I was taken to hospital by ambulance. That's never fun. By the way, those don't ride very smoothly. They are very, no, they uh, you know, but the guys and the ladies who were uh, part of that, uh, that unit were absolutely fantastic got me over to hospital so they found the bleeding ulcer but the problem is they found the bleeding ulcer was on top of a tumor and uh, we did a biopsy on the tumor and discovered that I had stomach cancer so obviously that was uh, that was something that had to get looked after immediately and we uh, we planned to have some surgery to remove the tumor from my stomach the problem is the location and the size of the tumor required that I had a full gastrectomy, I think is what it's called. It's ba- basically what it is. They take your whole stomach mm-hmm. out. And so you got to relearn how to eat and everything like that. But the problem is going into hospital at a time when COVID-19 was striking. So obviously it was, uh, it was a tough time. The other thing is, shortly after I had the surgery to remove the stomach, I developed a chest infection, which... I didn't find out until months later, just about killed me, but I managed to make it through that. But now here we are, and it's in the month of August, and we are now restarting. But I will tell everybody that I had a scan done recently at the Cross Cancer Institute in Edmonton, and they could not find any cancer anywhere. In the words of my doctor, the oncologist at the Cross Cancer Institute, he tipped his cap to uh, both my surgeons. I had two surgeons for the surgery. One uh, was uh, Dr. Johnson, who uh, was a thoracic surgeon because they wanted to cut into my rib cage to get up to my esophagus to make sure nothing had spread. Clearly, nothing has. And Dr. Schiller was my other doctor. He was the one who did the stomach uh, removal. And uh, anyway, so I had the scan done. And it looks like it wasn't so much, and you know, you knock wood when you say it, but it it looks like uh, it was more of a symptom or a situational cancer rather than a uh, a cancer that, that, you know, would be passed down from family member to family member, a hereditary thing. So that's what I'm hoping for. I'm hoping that we were able to get everything cleaned up 
and now it's a slow recovery for me as uh, as you and I both know it, it's not been easy it's been really tough the other thing too uh, I, I, I gotta bring Dale Howard Chuck up right now because obviously we've we've lost yeah. Dale over the last few weeks uh, he had stomach cancer and our good friend Darren Drager set me up to talk to Dale about his stomach cancer because he had his entire stomach removed and he was about eight months ahead of me, and so uh, I, I kind of figured when I, you know, when I when Dale tracked me down to to have a conversation, I figured, oh, this will be a five or a ten minute and that kind of thing. He was in zero rush. He gave so much of his time to me. He gave me forty five minutes that first time, and uh, we talked a lot about stomach cancer. We talked a lot about the recovery. We talked a lot about the Winnipeg Jets because obviously I worked there for a year and a half. And we knew the same people. I just missed him. Uh, Phil Housley had come in from Buffalo as uh, as he, he had been traded. Dale had been traded to the Buffalo Sabres. So I, ne- I never met him other than just the occasional scrum uh, conversations that you might have after a game. But anyway, Dale was wonderful to chat with and so giving of his time. And I appreciated it so much and gave me uh, a real big pep talk about a day and a half before my surgery that really kind of pushed me through and gave me uh, gave me some uh, some big time hope for the surgery and and uh, and I, I guess you know visualization is is a big thing for a lot of athletes and for him it was and he was able to impart some of that information to me. Then he got a hold of me about a month later to see how the surgery went and we continued to chat and then all of a sudden the 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 trail kind of ran dry. I, I sent a text and I got no response. Now, recently, Scott Oak on Hockey Night in Canada had had basically broken down when Dale had found out about his resurgence and the fact that his cancer had come back. And sure enough, I took a look at my text message to Dale. Mm-hmm. And uh, Dale had found out about maybe two or three days ahead of that text message. So I totally understand why I never heard back from him again, but I just I can't I just cannot say enough. Can't thank Darren enough for setting up the call, and uh, I'll never forget Dale's forty five minute conversation with me. It was uh, it was a very special uh, special phone call, and so were all the text messages. And when I found out that he had passed away, it was a very emotional day for me. It was very tough, and I, uh, I can only. I can only imagine, Bryn. I mean, I remember uh, messaging with Darren and, and uh, you know, that Dale was going to get a hold of you. And yeah. uh, as you know, uh, Dale was a terrific hockey player, but and it's a cliche, but he was a better person. He was a good man. And to have him take the time with what he'd gone through yes. uh, to try and prop you up, to try and say, here's what I went through, you can do this. Um, speaks to his character, and then uh, with you still in recovery uh, for his family and friends, the National Hockey League and fans everywhere, uh, to lose him um, so s- soon after it came back, um, I can imagine it was a tough day for you because there were a lot of people that were thinking he'd gotten past that and, and, and everything was going to be okay, and and you know, um, it, it makes it obvious what's obvious to you. You've gone through this. This is this is as real as it gets. Um, you were in the hospital for a long time. You were in there at a time when a lot of people who care about you and, and you only had to look at the feedback on the odd time uh, you, you got on Twitter or somebody uh, like, uh, you know, a friend of yours or myself uh, mentioned something about you, the reaction, uh, the number of reactions was overwhelming. And, uh, you know, it's, and, and people couldn't go and see you. Uh, no, well, that's even, not, even that's, family, Robin, I, I couldn't even have family come in. Yeah. It, it, it was and, that tough. And that's not, not, and that's not nearly as tough on us 
we're out we're out here healthy yeah we want to see and say hi but uh, to be in that situation man I, I that's a tough one I, I I'm just glad you got through because you didn't get any help from friends getting through in terms of having uh, being able to have friends around you the other thing too on Dale is that and I never thought about this till after is that the Dale Howard Chuck I was talking to is a coach you know, he was, he yeah. was a success, successful coach in the Ontario Hockey League. And really what he was doing is he was coaching me and prepping me for that surgery. And like I said, uh, won't be easily forgotten. Uh, I, You know what? Will never be forgotten is probably the best no. way to put it. And uh, I just, uh, like I said, uh, had, had to address that right off the top because th- that's why we have been away for so long and then and then the other thing now we're having to deal with is COVID-19 and how it's changed everything that that we love and how it's changed everybody's lives and uh I just uh it's it's when I take a look at 2020 and it's funny going into the year and I thought about this at some one of the off days when I was at the world juniors I'm thinking 2020 okay so 2020 vision and you know, this is going to be a really great year, and I was so pumped up about a lot of stuff. And for so many, so many people, it has really been just a crappy year. And when I think back to all of my sixty years, I, I've only had really four years that have really been stinky, and this is clearly one of them. And we still got a ways to go. And the other thing too uh, uh, about Dale, and then you know, we will we got a lot of stuff to to touch on, and uh, is that. Um, when you see the uh, the return of cancer to a guy like Dale, you I'd be lying if I didn't say that you you know once you've been touched on the shoulder by cancer, you wait for your turn for another return engagement, right? It like just you're going to think that way, and I'm trying not to. I'm yeah. trying to focus forward as much as I positive in a positive manner, and so. Anyway, like I said, I don't, I, I don't want to keep dwelling on it. I'd like to move forward, and, and that's exactly we're, what we're going to do. All right, when we come back, there's a lot of sports stuff to talk about, so we're going to get right to it. Okay, uh, all good. With uh, COVID nineteen sports, uh, nobody sitting in the seats. It just seems so horribly wrong. It doesn't seem right. Uh, you know, for diehard fans, are they turned off by not having people cheering their favorite team on? How how are you viewing it? Well, I tell you, Brennan, and you know, maybe this isn't the first thing you expect to hear on a. Uh, a sports podcast like ours, you know, the bigger picture is hung in the air for me uh, more so than the sports. The sports are important. Uh, How everything's changed with the need for masking, the need for social distancing, the lives that have been lost, the disruption to everything that we've come to consider normal from socializing to going to the store to all, all those things that, we've taken for granted and you'd expect nothing less because that's what our lives comes drops the hammer on everybody and part of uh, that effect is what happens with sports and you know as far as the the games themselves go you know i look at something like the nhl bubble Uh, right here in Edmonton and also the one in Toronto and how the NHL is getting through this. Um, The NBA is doing it. Uh, Major League Baseball has taken a different approach, Uh, you know, the non-bubble approach. Yeah. It's odd not to see people. It's odd not to see people in the stands. It really is. Um, I have to say, with what they've done here uh, with hockey uh, and in Toronto, They've done as good a job as you could possibly expect. I mean, whether it's something goofy uh, that we've seen in some buildings and some sports where they have cutouts of fans in the seats to just the use of uh, monitors and big screens and tarping off the seats, camera angles. You know, the game is still the game. The atmosphere has definitely changed, but, you know, 
I don't know how long we go this way. Long we have to go this way, but I I've got to think that it's not going to change anytime soon because you know the bigger question is COVID and when we get a handle on it. As much as we'd like to get back to normal, we can't just make that happen uh, without handling the, the reason we're going through it uh, in the first place. Do you like the cardboard cutout stuff that we're seeing in Major League Baseball? I, I see that Bernie from Weekend at Bernie's was uh, behind home plate in one of the uh, stadiums. I thought that was pretty funny. Well, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know what? It's fun. You might as well do it. Um, it's it's not like the fans uh, paying the freight, getting to sit there. But yeah, have it. Have some fun with it. I mean, have we got the? Uh, are we going to have the? Uh, uh, what's his name uh, from the Cubs? Uh, the foul ball guy. There should be. I think their uh, teams would be. Uh, smart to have a whole bunch of his cutouts uh, down the third baseline because that might rattle people. Why if I can blank in his name? Are you talking about? You're talking about the famous interference uh, down the left. Yes. Oh man, I why if I, uh, I, I said Bartman? Um, oh man. Yeah, I, Bart. Yeah. Okay. Well, How quickly uh, we yes. Steve Bartman. Thank you. That that situation was so awful that I don't think anybody wants to dredge that back up. So, um, but but I'm surprised we haven't seen world figures, you know, from history. Uh, I'm sure somebody will have some fun with it, but you're right about the NHL. I've just been killing it with both bubbles in Edmonton and Toronto. No positive tests at all. The NBA's had a few issues with guys wandering away from the bubble, but... It seems like they've got that fixed. And Major League Baseball, with no bubble, has been iffy at times where you started wondering whether or not it was going to kill their season. But they're still plugging away, so that's uh, that's that's pretty good. So I think for the most part, it's uh, it's rolling out not badly, but it just doesn't seem quite the same with the, with the lack of fans. But I think everybody's kind of uh, adapting to it a little bit. The other thing, too, with the NHL is that the – the time of year, I mean, we're, we're here in the month of August, and when you get 30-degree days and your team is out, Canada is really not as regional as the U.S. When a team like, oh, let's use the Pittsburgh Penguins are out, Robin. Once Pittsburgh's out, Pittsburgh doesn't care anymore. They don't give a shit, right? Nope. In Canada, I'm sensing that when the Oilers went out or the Flames or the Leafs went out, I, I think this might be one of those rare years where – fans in those markets went you know what i it's the middle of summer i should be golfing i shouldn't be watching hockey i'm starting to sense a little bit of that are you sensing any of that well yeah absolutely i mean as somebody who wrote the beat for many years and you worked in the national hockey league for a long time too bren uh, hockey in july and august when have we had that before um at, you know at the nhl level it's completely foreign to everybody and if the reason you cheer as a fan whether you're a, a flames fan an oilers fan a maple leafs fan if that team is not there you know don't you start looking at getting out to the cottage or or uh, go, taking that uh, driving vacation to go see Auntie So and So two provinces over. <laughs> it's uh, you know it's it's completely different. I mean, uh, I've covered Stanley Cups, and you're you know you're 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 done uh, by mid June, and you know the I think what the Oilers in 06 was I want to say June nineteenth. I flew out of Raleigh. Um, you know, and that's, you know, you don't get into July and August, so it's different right off the top. And the fan thing aside and the timing aside, Brendan, and we're going to get into this later because we got to talk CFL today. Yeah. But, you know, uh, whether it's the National Hockey League, the NBA, um, or Major League Baseball, let's not forget not only are there no fans i won't go as far to say there's no revenue because tv is involved oh revenue is the only reason we're doing this robin yeah to save some but i tell you what this is gonna i want to see this hit on the books of all three uh, of the major leagues uh, when the playing is done because while they're clawing back some of it i tell you what this has been a big kick below the belt 
for all leagues involved because you're still generating money from in-stadium uh, attendance, uh, souvenirs. You can't do everything online. I'm glad they're doing their best to claw some of it back, but I tell you what, there's going to be a day of reckoning when the playing is done. Let's backtrack a little bit. Let's focus on the Western teams, the Oilers, the Flames, and the Canucks. You know, all were targeting playoff spots in the month of February. Uh, all three made it anyway after that uh, almost five-month gap thanks to the play-in format. Oilers, horribly disappointing. The Calgary oh. Flames, disappointing. The Vancouver Canucks, surprising. But let's focus first on the two Alberta teams. And, you know, if you take it, let's look at the last 10 years. The Oilers have been a constant disappointment with the exception of the one playoff run. The Calgary Flames yeah. are a little bit different. They always show you that they might have something going, and then they just basically crap the bed. It just they, they they're probably putting their fans through a much different level of heartbreak than than the Oilers and the Oilers fans are going through. But both teams in in the province of Alberta are are, are I would class them as disappointing. Well, Bryn, for, for me, the the Oilers are the biggest disappointment. I mean, it's not even close. They had. The Chicago Blackhawks in the play-in round, um, who were the, the the open spot on the bingo card, if you ask me, even with Taves and Kane, uh, Corey Crawford missed most of the preparation time. They had a team that really they should have beaten. They've got the bubble here in their hometown, in their home arena. They get to sleep in their own beds. They've got a rabid fan base that can't wait to see what happens when they get into the actual playoff round, and they blow it. They lose. And to me, that's – I didn't see – I don't think anybody saw them losing that series. Some people will say they picked Chicago. Yeah, maybe they did. Uh, I didn't see a lot of it. That was a that was an opportunity blown, not only to entertain their fan base, which has been more than patient over all these years, but to actually keep interest going in the town where the bubble is, to fill up the bars, to get some people downtown. This is a city that's been hit hard, as many have been, and that's what you want. And now the Oilers are done. People might watch it on TV, but what happens to any buzz downtown? It's 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 dead. Okay, well, let's backtrack okay. on a couple of things because we have to. Uh, a couple of things from me. One, I, I think that playing in your home city is a disadvantage, not an advantage. And there's a couple of reasons from what I've been told. And that is uh, the Edmonton Oilers were not able to, for every one of their games, use their home locker room. It's frustrating when you uh, are playing, you know, you're dressing down the hall while the team you're playing is actually using your room. There's a bit of an emotional letdown from that. The other thing is, is that they were not sleeping in their own beds. They had to hotel up like everybody else. Yeah. Because yeah. They, they, so there could be no advantage. There's really no advantage. There, I don't think there was any advantage. I think there was disadvantage for both Toronto and Edmonton going through the uh, bubbles the way that they did. And the other thing really? too, if you don't have fans, what like, is that, you know what kind of home home advantage is it if you're not leaving the bubble anyway? They're no different than well, any other team. I think that I think there's an emotional letdown from watching the team you're playing using your locker room, and you're just down the hall uh, in 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 the uh, in the, that's like somebody coming in and crapping uh, in your house. Uh, you know, it's I I don't I don't think there was any advantage at all for the Edmonton Oilers or the Leafs. I think it was to their disadvantage. But you know, the, the, these teams are done, and the, I think that. You know, we'll we'll have plenty of time to talk about what's going to have to happen in Calgary and Edmonton. But, uh, you know, uh, in Calgary, there's going to be changes. And in Edmonton, there's going to be changes. And there's going to be a lot to talk about there. There's a lot of negative surrounding both Alberta teams. I don't think there's any Ooh. denying that. But the surprise for me has been the way the Vancouver Canucks have played through, uh, through all of this, led by their netminder. Uh, Markstrom is... Uh, and has been their their key guy. You, we can talk about their forwards, but for the most part, they get they've been getting better goaltending than both Edmonton and Calgary. It, would you agree with that? Oh yeah, I mean Markstrom's been the story. I think the jig might be up against Vegas. Um, yeah, that's 
that's a heck of a team they've got. I mean, I don't see a, a weakness with Vegas, um, you know, with the laner taking over the crease from Flurry. Uh, he's been terrific. Uh, I thought that would be well, and it's one game, so let's not get carried away. Yeah. But man, the the Canucks better turn that one around because Vegas looked like world beaters in that in that first game. And uh, I like the Canucks. They're a great story. They're a young team. Their best players are are still young. Uh, Markstrom coming in like he has and being so good. Um, I'm from Vancouver, and I haven't seen the Canucks go deep. Uh, for a while and they're not deep yet but you know and i don't go with this canada's team thing yet either um, no i'm with you i don't buy no. into that but it's you know we know the canucks they're decent rivals with the oilers uh i i wouldn't have picked them to you know if if you were to ask me two of the three uh canadian teams out here that we're going to get through uh, it would have been the oilers uh, and, and the flames not the Canucks, but hey, good for them. Um, the coast is buzzing, at least, uh, while Oilers and Flame fans, uh, uh, you know, do yard work. Yeah, gnashing their teeth. And the other thing, too, Travis Green, for me, doesn't get enough doesn't get enough credit. I think he's got a great handle on that bench, and he knows exactly what all four lines are going to do. And the other thing, too, he's not afraid to play all four lines, which I think, it, you know, there's been some question marks about – the way uh, the coaching staff handled things with the Oilers in the play-in series. And uh, and also there's going to be uh, a few people that question Jeff Ward's situa- situation oh. and some of the calls that he made. But Travis Green, I can't think of anything, and I've watched a, a fair bit of this. Travis Green, I think, has got a great control on, on uh, the Canucks, but I think Vegas is, is too strong. Okay, I'll tell you what, there's going to be a lot of uh, bubble hockey talk over the next little while. When we come back, uh, I've got a lot of other things to talk about. Some broadcast bloopers over the last little while. Leon Dreisaitl, what a year he's had. Sure. We'll talk about the CFL season. The Edmonton, whatever you want to call them, of the Canadian Football Leagues. And uh, also, uh, Alfonso Davies has really been, a, he's turned into an unbelievable story. We'll get to that. Okay, let's stick with hockey uh, for a couple more things. Leon Dreisaitl, if you told me that uh, there was going to be another Hart Trophy winner, and I'm convinced that we're going to see this coming down the pipe here in a few weeks, if you told me there was going to be another uh, Hart Trophy handed out to an Edmonton Oilers player, I would immediately think Connor McDavid. But Leon Dreisaitl, what a year, Robin. Unbelievable. Well, you know, I didn't know that he could repeat uh, the previous season. I didn't think he was going to fall off the edge of the, of the hockey earth, but he took such a big jump uh, two seasons ago. Uh, you know, it was remarkable. And he, he not only didn't fall off, he, he looked better than before. And he was, he was leading the Art Ross race in a, in a walk. I mean, it wasn't close. Leon Dreisaitl's no fluke, and Leon Dreisaitl uh, two years ago put aside any notion that uh, that long-term deal the Oilers signed him to uh, was maybe taking a bit of a chance because right now he's one of the best bargains in the National Hockey League. The other thing, too, is that they really made teams pay on the power play. They they were clicking big time with the man advantage, and I guess, you know what? The fact that the power play went soft for them in the play-in series, might you know, I, I think that that plays a huge role in uh, in how everything shook down. But Leon was uh, was fantastic with the man advantage, and but but he also has proven to be a big leader. So uh, we got to tip our cap to Leon. And like I said, uh, everything that was done through the season that that goes a long way back. But uh, we haven't had a chance to address it, so we thought we should do it here. The other thing, too, broadcasters have really kind of taken a beating over the last year. Don Cherry with the you people comments, and he was turfed. Jeremy Roenick with some uh, untimely comments. And recently, Mike Milbury uh, made a comment about women that, uh, that for me, when I first heard it, and I happened to be watching that game live, 
I cringed because mm-hmm. I went, you know what? If he were a little smarter in a situation like this, and in fairness, when you're doing live broadcasts, there's no delete button. You can't go back. Once you've said it, you've said it. But you've got yeah. to have a really good filter. Mike Milbury is a former hockey player, former general manager, who now does some broadcasting. His broadcasting is like third on his resume. He he just should never have said it, and he's going to pay the price. And uh, I just can't, you know, and rightfully so. It was a dumb comment. Same thing with Jeremy and uh, and Don Cherry's comments. You've just got to recognize that, well, times are a little different now. You've just got to find a better way to to get your point across. That's how I view it. You? Well, I tell you, Bryn, you and I are both of an age we, we remember – uh, when things were different, when you say, when we say back in the day, we're not talking five years ago, you know, we're talking 25 years ago or 30 years ago. And it's not about the good old days or, or well, geez, it was, it was acceptable when we grew up. Uh, some of the comments that have been made, a lot of things change. We as individuals, as a society, we need to grow. We need to change. Um, we're talking about guys, you know, the youngest one, I guess, would be uh, Ronick, who've got caught up in this. And, you know, some people call it cancel culture now. And, and yes, on social media, at least, uh, there's uh, people can tend to jump in. Uh, the sides are polar opposites as opposed to having discussions. It's, it's no, you're wrong, no, you're wrong. Um But we've got to realize whether we like it or not, whether you're 75 or 25, that we've changed and we've grown. And you just can't say some of the things that were acceptable 5, 10, 20 years ago. Times change. Uh, Some people want to say that's being oversensitive. But I tell you what, if you're saying something that makes a whole group of people – feel bad about themselves or paints them uh, with with one broad brush, um, you can't do it. It doesn't fly. And like you, when Milbury said what he said, if he would have used almost any other word, um, you know, maybe he, maybe he skates on it, but he didn't. And the fact is there was great offense there. And uh, that's how it is. It, you don't have to think it's fair, but if those are the rules, if you don't play by the rules, then you're going to there's going to be a price to pay. And all three of these guys that we've mentioned, all three of whom we know to different degrees, yeah. have paid yeah. a price. And uh, the, you know, we're focusing on negatives with these three. I guess if, they, if we're looking for a positive, Kevin Bieksa for me has been fantastic oh. on Hockey Night in Canada, and I. Uh, uh, you know, there are some people that don't like him. You know, they don't like him because they still can't isolate the fact that he's not playing against their favorite teams anymore. Yeah, and I think I that think that's unfortunate. He is he is really sharp. I mean, I didn't expect this coming out of him. Uh, I haven't talked to, to him enough uh, in a reporter player situation to know him. Uh, anything resembling well and of course that dynamic is different when you're talking player reporter his analysis has been terrific it's sharp it's insightful um and it's not old hockey player-esque if you know what i mean yeah it's it's, you know he doesn't talk like it's an inside joke uh uh, or an inside thing that only players will understand he analyzes things very precisely and uh, gets his message across very clearly. He's been terrific. I don't know where that came from, but, man, has he been good. Well, obviously somebody made the right call there, and because he was such a pain in the ass if <laughs> uh, if he wasn't playing for your team, he uh, I, I think he's been just delightful. It's been great to watch, and I hope that the powers that be, and I'll use the quotey fingers there, don't get to him and say, look, you're going to have to rein it in a little bit. I'd like to see him let it out a little bit. Anyway, that's uh, there's a positive uh, after uh, the negative stuff with Milbury, Roenick, and Don Cherry. So let's leave it at that. We'll be talking about that for a fair bit. Okay. Uh, and, and by the way, obviously, you've noticed no guests on this one, and that's because we've got a lot of ground to cover. Let's get to the Canadian Football League. Oh, my God. Uh, I, I was on with our good friend Rod Peterson 
not mm-hmm. long ago. And Rod said, what do you think about the CFL season? I said, I'm really scared that if they don't get a season in this year that we're going to lose the league. I still feel that way. Uh, I don't know how really? you feel about that. I just think that this is a league that cannot afford to have no income coming in. It, it's got a very small TV uh, what's the word I'm looking the rights the rights holder situation they get a little bit yep. of a TV deal it's not like the National Football League they don't need a single fan in the seats with the TV deal they have the Canadian Football League exactly the opposite the TV deal is not really huge so it, they're a gate driven league yes. and when you go a whole year without gate there's a few teams like Toronto uh, you know Montreal uh, I, I don't think I, I'm not sure if I'm going to put Ottawa in that situation but I just, I just don't know if they're going to financially be able to make it by sitting out a year. No, I, and here's the thing, Brent. I mean, yes, there's millionaires and, and, and some big money involved in the, in the CFL, but relative to the NFL and the NBA uh, and the NHL, it's a mom-and-pop operation. Sure, absolutely. Financially. And, yeah, how many teams can go through – especially when they rely on the gate and the jerseys and the hot dogs and all the things that go with the live experience, how many of the teams now uh, get through this um, for next year, whenever next year comes? Because I tell you what, the Edmonton Eskimos were long thought one of the, uh, you know, wealthiest franchises, uh, you know, best run and, and, and one of the moneyed teams they're hurting just like everybody else. Now you've got players, um, you know, even before uh, the season was pulled, wondering what they're going to do. Now much of them have opted, to, many of them, I should say, have, have opted to go to the NFL and try their luck there. And sure, some of them will be back because that's how it works. Players always go take a run at the NFL if they can. Yeah. But the thing is, there's so much up in the air now. That loss of revenue, um, do we have as many teams when we start another season uh, as we had the last time they played? I, I don't honestly believe, Bryn, and maybe I'm uh, looking, being too optimistic, that the league is in trouble But in terms of folding. But, man, there could be – it could look different the next time we're uh, in a training camp, that's for sure. You know, and something that's been running through my mind a lot the last couple of weeks is whether or not there could potentially be a fit between The Rock and his XFL and the CFL. For, for example, like a, a bit of a high offensive blend of football between the two different leagues, American and Canadian football you know, the league would run late spring and through the summer away from the National Football League, and it would be marketed very well, I would have to think. I guess the question is, is that are people going to see the Canadian Football League because of the Canadian part, or are they going because they want to watch some football and have a couple of beers at Commonwealth Stadium on a beautiful night or, you know, uh, or at Mosaic in uh, Regina? I'm just wondering whether or not we're going to see this thing morph into something a little bit different than the traditional Canadian Football League. You mean? Do you mean beyond the short term, like beyond? Uh, uh, I'm talking uh, about uh, uh, like for next season, whether or not we oh. see a bit of a hybrid between these two leagues that maybe could uh, feed each other. You'd have U.S. markets. You'd have Canadian. Uh, there's. Uh, the Rock knows all about the Canadian Football League because he, you know, he follows it quite closely. That there's obviously some markets that uh, that really might be able to take this under their wing a little bit. I don't know. I I'm just spitballing at this point because I yeah. I think that uh, if the CFL is back, it's going to have to come back in a little different form next time. We'll see to financially be well, able to I, make it. I don't think that would fly, Bryn, to be honest, in the long term. The Canadian Football League, and we can list all the reasons, three down football, so on and so forth, it's unique. I think you have to find a way to make the model work. And I'll tell you something, and I hadn't thought of this until COVID came along. If so, If so many teams are close to the edge. Now, that's an assumption. Nobody's showing us their books. Right. But if, there's, if they're so close to the edge, it could be 
mean big trouble, then the model is not working financially. I'm not talking about the financial model. What you talk about with a blend, uh, at least in the short term, if that pays some of the bills, that makes sense. But I don't know that the on the field product um, works. I think the charm in the Canadian Football League is that it is what it is. So I think you've got to keep the game as it is, keep as many teams as you can, but find out how we make this work because it's it, money's not short because every football team in, in the CFL has a bunch of millionaires on it. One or two guys really get paid, quarterback, uh, and pick your next best player, whether he's on offense or defense. Um it's not because they're paying a bunch of guys like millionaires. So whatever is, why ever it's coming up short, they got to figure that out. Change the mo- the financial model, but don't change the game. I know that's easier said than done, but I don't want to see a blend of XFL and CFL uh, because in the long term, it just becomes a minor league ultimately for the NFL. Well, I, I think it's always been that. I, I don't think that I, I think that there's great college players in the US that just can't quite make the cut in the NFL and they look yeah. to the Canadian Football League. So I've always viewed the CFL in some respects as being a bit of a farm league with a unique brand of football, but it's been a farm league to the National Football League. The other thing too is that it's all about marketing now. You, you and yeah. I have been going to games. Like, did you go to games when you grew up in on the West Coast? You go to Empire Stadium. I oh. was, I was uh, in the in their version of the Knot Hole Gang at Empire Stadium. Used to be able to go to uh, the bank there. Yeah, uh, I want to say TD and get uh, discounted tickets. Yeah, I, I was there, and and you know it was. I didn't have anything to compare it to. I didn't, you know. Well, you weren't exposed to the National Football League. The National Football League is just over-marketed everything. And, yeah, uh, yeah, I just – and I grew up in the Woodward's Knothole Gang at Clark Stadium. But the problem now is that getting anybody under 30 into a CFL game is pretty tough right now because they just don't market the product. There's no identification with players at all. They don't really have a clue what they're doing. We're going to be talking about this for months. And uh, I guess we'll see what uh, Randy Ambrosi's got up his sleeve. And uh, we'll see whether or not they're able to kind of hold it together. And one last thing, Bryn, I got to get it in before we move on. One fundamental problem is, is that in the biggest city in the league, yeah, uh, in terms of population and media, Nobody gives a squirt about the CFL. Nope. And uh, that's the problem. Uh, You know, like I said, there's a lot of problems right now, but I think the biggest problem the CFL is facing is that they're not playing. Nobody's sitting in the seats. And with this league, when you're not playing, there's absolutely zero talk, unless you're in Regina or Saskatchewan <laughs> where that's their big uh, you know that's the big thing for them. Hey, one other thing yep. just before we wrap up on the CFL, you referred to them as the Edmonton Eskimos. They are no longer the Edmonton Eskimos. Uh Now, I know we went through the big <laughs> Washington Redskin thing with uh, the National yeah. Football League, but I I view the Eskimo name and the Redskin thing is complete for me they're completely different. Uh the Redskin thing was horribly horribly demeaning. I'm now I don't fall into a category where it really truly affects me directly, but uh, the yeah. comparable between the Redskin name and the Eskimo name, it's there's no real comparable to me. But if the Edmonton Eskimos decided that they were pissing off a lot of people, uh, you know, uh, Inuit people by using the name Eskimos and they wanted to change the name. I'll back the football club because we talked about how times change and I'm sure they'll come up with a nice catchy new name and people will just have to adapt. I know one thing, it doesn't put me off anything. I'll still go to games. Doesn't, uh, I know some people don't want to support it. I know some people who don't want to support the two uh, corporate entities that kind of push this a little harder too. 
But you know what? It's a free world. Do what you want, I guess, right? Well, you and I will, and a lot of people, I imagine, uh, six decades worth, uh, we will get caught in the Eskimo name thing oh, yeah. uh, more, more than a few times. Um, yes, it's the Edmonton Football Club or whatever you want to say. I'll t- I tell you what, Bryn, um, and I'm in the same position as you and a, a lot of fans. I didn't have a big problem with the name. I, but likewise, I don't have a big problem with them doing away with the name. You and I don't have skin in that game. Now, if you're Inuit, Indigenous, and you have a problem with it, that's what matters. And I had a debate with a lot of people. They're not dumb people. They aren't uh, uh, racist people. But they're wondering, well, what the heck? Why are we get? you know, what's the big deal? Well, there is no big deal to you and I. But that doesn't matter. What matters is if there's a percentage or a segment, whether it's 10%, 20%, 30%, whatever it might be, of Inuit people, of indigenous people that say, we have a problem with it, then that's not a fight worth having. You say, okay, we get it. Times change. We never said it out of disrespect. And there's no question in my mind, Brent, the Eskimos meant no disrespect with the name. Fans who love the name and didn't want to see it go didn't mean disrespect by cheering for a team called the Eskimos. But none of that matters. If it broad brushes and paints uh, an entire segment of our population in a way that they don't want to be painted with a name they don't want to be referred to as, that's a good enough reason to move on from that name. Okay, and let's uh, touch on one one final topic. Every year, Canadian press anoint an athlete as their uh, male or female athlete of the year, right? I, uh, yeah. I, for me right now, Alfonso Davies has got to be the front runner by a country kilometer for the uh, for for the uh, uh, award this year because what uh, the Edmonton kid has had quite a year, right? you know, going from the Vancouver Whitecaps over to the Bundesliga and playing for Bayern Munich, and uh, they just romped to the title in the German League, and then uh, they end up becoming uh, the champions of the Champions League. And uh, I guess the biggest, the biggest question, and the kid's been so much fun to watch, is uh, what's Fonzie's success going to mean for Canada in the future as they uh, attempt to maybe qualify for a World Cup? And then the other thing, too, is that is he going to be able to fire up kids at the grassroots level to make them want to play soccer? And are we going to be able to see... Uh, we're going to be able to see another league so that kids over the age of 14 can play. Still the most participated sport in the country, soccer, because it's inexpensive. And uh, I, I don't know. I'm going to be curious to see whether or not Alfonso is going to be able to make a difference over the next 10 to 15 years. And I think he's going to be able to do that. I think so too, Bryn. I think so because he's such a dynamic player. You know, He's not a tough-to-beat goal, uh, goalkeeper. He's not a punishing defender. Hey, if a Canadian's any of those things, he's going to make a name for himself in soccer. He is a dynamic offensive player that grabs the highlight reel and makes it his own. There's going to be kids out there who watch Alfonso Davies play and say, that's what I want to be. And that's how you get the growth. And we all know that a lot of those kids never become that. But if you've got that dream and it involves the game of soccer and uh, an example like Alfonso Davies, that yes, it can happen, you, you've got something. I will wait and see in this country for real growth and big picture stuff because I don't know that you can put that much on the shoulders of one great player like Davies but he's certainly going to have a lot of kids thinking about playing the game, and there's no negative there. 
The other thing, too, 2026, it's uh, Mexico, Canada, and the U.S. that will be hosting the World Cup in a shared situation. The three cities that have been uh, basically targeted to host games in Canada, Montreal, Toronto, and Edmonton. I noticed that the city of Edmonton, for example, are doing a questionnaire right now to see whether or not uh, sports fans or taxpayers, I guess, in uh, in the community are interested still in moving forward with uh, bidding for games, I would suggest that you're never going to hold a bigger event. In, in Edmonton, they're talking about four games, three to four games, and I would uh, suggest that that would be bigger. That'll be the biggest event the city of Edmonton will ever host, and of course, they'll do it upright. They'll uh, they'll turn it into a bit of a festival. But uh, if you get a chance, yeah. go to the City of Edmonton website and tell them whether or not you're for or against hosting games. And, like, the COVID-19 thing has changed. People's economic situations have changed. Whether or not people want to spend uh, 40 to $60 million hosting these games, uh, I, I just I, – we're talking about worldwide access on television to your city yeah. – I just, uh, to me, it's a total no-brainer. You got to move ahead with it, but that's how I see it, anyway. Well, yeah, exactly. One quick thing before we go to break, Bryn. You mentioned COVID uh, again. Uh, today, um, being Monday, uh, we'll be out all this week when people uh, download. Uh, Usain Bolt has tested positive for COVID nineteen. Really. Wow. So now, now uh, are you really surprised because he still lives in a very small country that I'm sure is strugg- struggling. So it doesn't surprise me. And also you're talking about a guy who is so revered in his country yep. that that he would be meeting people every day. Uh, I'm not I'm not surprised to hear that. I'm saddened to hear it, but hopefully everything's going to be okay. Well, he was out on Twitter talking about it and of course the effects of it very gratefully are greatly. He is of course a very healthy uh, man still in the prime of his life, but it re it shows you that it can reach out and touch anybody. Um, yeah. Usain Bolt. I just saw it a couple hours ago and it, it slipped my mind. So yeah, Bolt's uh, COVID-19 positive. Okay, so we're slowly wrapping things up here. As I said, this has been kind of us today, Robin, and uh, we'll get back to having guests joining us on our podcast, The Outsiders, over the next little while. But uh, we just needed to vent a little bit because seven months of sitting around and just talking to ourselves hasn't been a lot of fun. Well, I I would suggest it's been a little tougher for you than for me, but uh, (laughs) we uh, we shall start with today and move forward because you know what, Brent, uh, before everything changed, uh, for uh, the world and for, for us, especially you on a personal level, um, I thought we were building some momentum. Uh, we'd had a great uh, roster of guests in our first 20 episodes. We were having a lot of fun. Uh, so we've been on the sidelines for seven months, but we're back now. And, I certainly am looking forward to get going again. Okay, let's uh, let's address a few things here too. Well, let's uh, let's tell everybody you can email us, and the email address is mightymouth at shaw.ca. But there's another way that you can get to us, and that is on Twitter, and our Twitter handle is at outsiders twenty twenty. Outsiders is all yeah. in caps, so that's at outsiders twenty twenty on Twitter. Please, uh, it's a, it's an account we kind of started up just as we were going into the little break that we've been at. So this is the first time we've actually been able to pass that one along. The other thing, too, it's important to tell your friends and also subscribe. Just check out our RSS uh, feed on your favorite ear candy sites, whatever, and uh, pass that along. Copy and paste to your buddies. Uh, that would be great. The other thing, too, is that, yeah, we are back, and we're not going away. That's the plan. Your support is uh, greatly appreciated. Financial support also is very, very important for all of us, and uh, 
If you're interested in advertising, uh, if you are looking at maybe being a potential advertiser for us, let's talk. It's uh, it, it's uh, yeah. it's something that uh, we we want to we want to take this and we want to get bigger and better. And the only way we can do that is with your support. And uh, it's it was growing, and unfortunately, we had to stop down for seven months, but. I think uh, I think it's fair to say that we're ready to get rolling again, and I'm excited about it. I don't know about you. Oh, you got me uh, at the word go, Bren. We're uh, you know that was a long wait, and um, I want to just roll. On. You know what? And us getting going again and keep going means good things all around. And you got my drift more than anybody. Absolutely. Let's hope we don't ever miss another episode because that means good things all around. Weekly, every Monday we come out and uh, we're uh, happy to be back. Rob, and thanks for your time today. And uh, thanks to everybody who's tuned us in. Okay. Okay, man. All right. Talk to you next time. All right. was recorded earlier because we were ashamed to do it now.